Resident Evil has had many faces, and even the lack of one. Over its 25 years of existence, I've seen this franchise transform, mold, and redefine itself over and over and over again. Being everything from a teeth grinding horror madhouse to a co-op over the top Hollywood action romp to, most recently, an absolute thirst trap. Wow. I've seen the franchise take detours into different genres, set pieces, and concepts. Some more successful than others. And everything the franchise has attempted, accomplished, and even failed at is in Resident Evil Village one way or another. From a genre-defining breakthrough to some of the more debatable entries, Resident Evil Village is the most Resident Evil ass game of them all. Let me break this down. The foundation of Resident Evil Village lies on, well, the actual village. It's a sprawling maze-like area with dead ends, locked doors, and obtuse paths. But as the game progresses, it connects to the other areas, unraveling new ones to be discovered, rewarding the player with keys and items that compel them to backtrack and re-explore it. This was a trope defined by the franchise's very first entry back in 1996, and it was a revolution for horror games, and the first to define a genre, the survival horror genre. It took elements from adventure games with exploration, backtracking, and item-based puzzles, and then applied survival to it by giving the player very limited resources and enemies that soaked up that precious, precious ammunition. It was a slow-paced slog through a maze-like environment of narrow hulls, forcing the player to make life or death choices around every corner of the confusingly designed Oswell Spencer Mansion. This is a characteristic that would come and go through the franchise, with backtracking and puzzles being last seen most prominently in the fourth entry in the series, Code Veronica, back in 2000. It did make its grand return in Resident Evil 7, but even then, the exploration was pale in comparison to 1, 2, and Veronica. That is, until Resident Evil Village. The village opens and unravels similarly to the original Oswell Mansion from 1 and the Raccoon City Police Department from 2, or even more accurately, like Code Veronica's European Gothic Palace and Victorian Mansion, especially considering its similar aesthetic to Lady Dimitrescu's castle in Resident Evil Village. Speaking of Big Lady D, let's talk about being chased. As you navigate the halls of Dimitrescu's castle, she and her daughters will stalk and follow you as you desperately try to find keys and items to unlock and open other areas. This iconic and terrifying characteristic comes straight from Resident Evil 3, Nemesis. Resident Evil 3 threw a wrench in the tropes that 1 and 2 had created, trading off the slow pacing for urgency and paranoia that big baddie Nemesis could bust through at any moment. A towering, invincible foe that stalks you constantly, ramping up the pressure when you'd least expect it. Like many ideas of the Resident Evil franchise, the mechanic of constantly being pursued wouldn't make a return until, again, Resident Evil 7 with Jack Baker. But it wasn't fully mastered until Resident Evil 2 Remake with Mr. X. The Resident Evil 2 Remake took Jack Baker's stalking mechanic and launched it to the nth degree with Mr. X, making him a towering, silent goon that slammed through anything to get you. Mr. X did make an appearance in the OG Resident Evil 2 during the B scenario, but not to the same degree as Nemesis, and Capcom put it full force in the remake. Lady Dimitrescu is the embodiment of both Jack Baker and Mr. X, a family woman just looking after her own while also being an intimidatingly huge individual with big, I'm gonna f you up real hard energy. While you're traversing villages many different environments, there'll be treasure to find, animals to hunt, and this jolly old fella to find solace in as you sell items, upgrade weapons, and buy new ones that you can organize in your Tetris-like inventory. All of this is thanks to Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 ripped the franchise away from its fixed camera angles, expanded your arsenal, and turned the harrowing odds against one zombie up to 11, favoring overwhelming stress over pure horror. A near copy of Village's encounters with the Lycans, especially in its opening sequence when you're overwhelmingly outnumbered and have to barricade yourself into a house. 4 introduced the Tetris-like inventory case, the treasure hunting, currency, and a merchant to sell items with. Most of these mechanics are defining a 4's identity, and, interestingly, never appeared in the franchise again. That is, until now, with Village. Some of 4's influences on Village may not be as apparent as others, however. Probably the most notorious area in Village is House Beneviento, which not only features an adorable baby, but these terrifying ghost dolls which aren't entirely new to the franchise. 
While 4 was in development, it had gone through several different prototypes until coming to what it is today. One internal version of the game was known as the Hallucination version. In this prototype build, there was a room known simply as the Doll Room, where Leon Kennedy would fight against these pesky 19th century porcelain dolls. While this didn't end up making the cut for Resident Evil 4, it was revived and cemented in Village, leaning full force into the supernatural elements that Resident Evil only toyed with behind the curtains. And it gets to be a little nice wink and nod to us Resident Evil nerds who caught it. And with no reasonable transition, let's talk about Chris Redfield. An overarching plot device in Resident Evil Village is Chris, who swoops into the opening moments of the game, killing Ethan's wife and kidnapping his baby. Chris is among the longest standing characters in the franchise, first appearing in Resident Evil 1 alongside Jill Valentine. But the game to have the most defining impact on his character, shaping him into the bulky military head that he is now, is Resident Evil 5. Taking him from the soft-faced boy from Resident Evil 1 and Code Veronica and establishing his military attitude and muscles. Mechanically, Village didn't really take that much from the co-op focused 5, aside from carrying the weight of Redfield's pecs. But when Resident Evil 6 rolled around, it had completely launched the franchise into full-blown Hollywood antics with over-the-top action and a sprawling cast of characters that'd make even a soap opera jealous. Village captures six essence at its finest near the closing hours, when we step into the shoes of Chris Tricep Redfield and go buck wild on waves of lichens, all Call of Duty style, all of which comes to a close with a mushroom cloud. While Resident Evil 6 is notoriously divisive among fans for being a full-on Hollywood action game, it seems that Village couldn't help itself from going a little off the rails once again. But hey, at least it didn't have a zombie T-Rex monster thing, right? Yeah! Obviously, Resident Evil Village carried a lot over from its predecessor, Resident Evil 7. While 7 softly returned to its exploration and backtracking roots, its biggest contribution to the franchise was its change to a first-person perspective. Yeah. Resident Evil 7 was the first true reimagining the franchise had seen in a decade since Resident Evil 4, but this time around, making it first-person, leaning all in on horror and lightly attempting to revisit the franchise's DNA with an emphasis on tight spaces, exploration, and arbitrary locked doors. This is something that Village doubles down on. More interesting is how the game is structured, showcasing Resident Evil 7's antagonists as a family front and center, with each foe having their own distinct area to explore and maneuver through. A prominent trait carried over into Village's narrative structure when being introduced to the Four Lords. Resident Evil 7 felt like an attempt to reposition the franchise with a new generation, and revisit old concepts in a way that was more palatable with modern gaming trends. It would have been risky for Capcom to put new players against a sprawling, intricate mansion filled with puzzles and backtracking, tropes that hadn't been seen in mainstream AAA games for decades at this point. But after 7's success, those very elements of backtracking, item searching, and exploration came back full force in Resident Evil 2 Remake. Resident Evil 2 Remake was a no-holds-barred representation of what classic Resident Evil exploration and inventory management was, but built into the modern age, and now making a grander, more expansive return in Village. Lastly, we need to talk about Resident Evil lore, because Village is just bursting at the seams with it. In the final hours of the game, it is revealed that the main villain Mother Miranda's existence recontextualizes the backstory of the entire franchise. But no other game has made a similar contribution other than Code Veronica, one that I believe helped define Resident Evil's absurd and complicated lore that we know oh so well today. Resident Evil has grown to have a soap opera-like backstory that spans hundreds of years, involving Nazi-like virologists cloning, estranged families, and bio-organic terrorism. And Veronica was the first to take it all and put it front and center, introducing rather theatrical and eccentric villains, opening the gates beyond just Oswell Spencer's madness and introducing Edward Ashford, a character like Spencer fixated on cloning and biochemical shenanigans. Basically, Code Veronica's Ashford family walked so Resident Evil 4 Salazar could run, and Village's four lords could soar. And, in many ways, Village's four lords, while still an iteration on Seven's Baker family, feels closely akin in their theatrics and over-the-top personas to Code Veronica's Ashford family. <laughs> Especially in the end of Village, when we learn Mother Miranda's impact on the entire franchise's lore, which is a lot to impact. 
This is similar to the impact the Ashford family had on Resident Evil's lore that interlaced alongside Oswell Spencer. Veronica had the most deepening effect on the game's lore at that time, just as Village has now, causing a ripple effect for what's to come in the future of the franchise. Now up to this point with each new installment, Resident Evil has introduced a new idea, some of which were iterated on for sequels to come, while others were left behind as the genre shaped and molded. Resident Evil Village, on the other hand, has left none of those ideas behind. More than any Resident Evil before it, Village does the most to embody everything the franchise has been up to this point. Village is a culmination of all of that, every single element wrapped up and stapled together. Whether it works, well, that's up to you to decide, but unabashedly, and of course as a Resident Evil apologist at times, I love it. And while it does feel like a Frankenstein's monster, it is an encapsulation of the franchise's 25 years. And for that reason alone, it makes Village one of the most special Resident Evil games to date. And it does a lot to push the franchise forward while doubling down on its past.